Well, we're going to look this morning at learning how to pray through looking at the prayers of Moses. We're going to start off with four simple words that Moses prayed. Actually, these were the first recorded prayers that Moses ever prayed in the Bible. And then we're going to finish with four other words that he prayed further on in his life as he grew in his prayer life. Moses was a great prayer. But the first recorded prayers, the first recorded words of Moses praying is when God was speaking to him through that burning bush and uh, telling him he had to go back to Egypt to rescue Israel, the place where he was brought up as a child. It was very challenging. If any of you have seen the Prince of Egypt, you'll know why that is. And the four words that he prays to God at that time are these. Please send someone else. Not very spiritual. But do you know what was good about those words is that they were very honest words. And God in our prayers loves honesty. Do you remember last week we put up that slide about how to pray? Three things. First of all, keep it simple. Secondly, keep it honest. Thirdly, keep it going. And Moses did these things. So that was a very honest prayer. And God answered that prayer. He sent his brother Aaron to be with him as his mouthpiece because Moses was afraid. He had a bit of a speech impediment. God said to him, isn't it enough? Isn't it enough that I'm with your mouth? I did create the mouth. But, OK, I'll send you Aaron with you. And actually, Moses might have regretted that prayer later in his life because Aaron really let him down quite badly. So it was an honest prayer. Secondly, Moses prayed a simply, simple prayers. In the passage that we just read, it says that God spoke to Moses as a man speaks to a friend. And God does not need long words. He does not need long sentences. In fact, long sentences can sometimes be quite bad. Often the shortest prayers, the shortest, simplest prayers are the most powerful. Lord, help me. Lord, save me, rescue me. He was a simple prayer. We don't have to go into his presence with these and thous and, oh, thou art the most magnificent. No. Simplicity is good in prayer. And then he stuck at it, didn't he? He kept it going. Many books have been written about praying and many sermons, probably millions of sermons have been preached about praying. But at the end of the day, there's only one way that we're going to grow in prayer and learn to pray. As George Muller said, we learn to pray by praying. Over the years, I've tried all sorts of different ways of praying, different methods, and they've they've all been good in different ways. Acts, do you remember that one? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving and supplication. Other times um, I've gone to the Lord's Prayer. I always seem to come back to the Lord's Prayer. It's so complete. And if we learn to pray the Lord's Prayer, we find that it's that it, it covers nearly everything that we want. And I'm the kind of person that needs variety. I like variety. But one thing I have learned in this journey is that almost whatever method I use, God is waiting for me. And when I actually pray with my heart to him, I encounter him. I meet with him in some way. He speaks to me in some way. And I'm benefited greatly. We need to just pray and keep it going. Moses found a place to pray. Do you know it says here, it says he built a tent uh, far off from the camp. He actually had a, a special tent, um, maybe a spare tent, and he took it outside the camp of Israel. He planted it there and it was far off from the camp. So he had to make an effort to get there, but it was far enough away from the camp that he wouldn't be distracted by the people of Israel. And we need to find a place or places to pray where we will be away from the distractions, away from our, uh, our phones, our text messages, away from uh, uh, people and our worries and just give some time to God. And I would suggest the beginning of the day was a good time for that. Jesus himself, he, it says he had a habit of, uh, of praying early. 
He also had places to pray. When he was in Jerusalem, it says he went to the Mount of Olives, as was his habit. And we need to form habits of prayer. When I was 17 years old, I became a Christian, and uh, the person who led me to the Lord, uh, he sent me in the post that night some Bible reading notes, and he said, just try praying and reading your Bible for 15 minutes a day. And I thought, 15 minutes? Wow, it seems so long. And actually at the time, sometimes it did seem long, but I was so grateful to him because that formed in me a habit of daily prayer that at the beginning of the day I would tune into him. God wants us to pray continually actually and consistently through the day but if our heart is never tuned in at the beginning of the day that will be very hard. He wants us to pray as we get the emails, pray as we do the tasks, pray as we get the difficulties, pray for blessing, pray for this, pray for that but unless our heart is tuned it's going to be difficult. If you find it, think it's difficult, think about Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. And this is what it says of her. Susanna Wesley, mother of John and Charles, promised the Lord that for every hour she spent in entertainment, she would give an hour to him in prayer and Bible study. Wow. That would mean some of us would be praying quite a lot. But she actually was so busy. She had a husband who was extremely impractical. Uh, she had 10 children. In fact, she had 19 children, but nine of them died in infancy. And in the middle of the day, she would get her apron and pull it over her head and form a tent, her tent of meeting. And she said to the children, when I've got that apron over my head, you do not disturb me. And she prayed. The product of her prayers produced Charles Wesley, uh, who, who, who wrote hundreds, uh, over a thousand hymns, I believe, in his lifetime, some of which we still sing today. And John Wesley, who in his life, if there was any person that transformed the face of this country in the 18th century, it was John Wesley. He had a praying mother. Our prayers are effective and effectual. So she kept it going, didn't she? Let's have a think now about the other things that Moses uh, prayed for. The three things. First of all, he prayed for the presence of God. At this point in time, Israel had messed up. They had uh, got Aaron to build them that uh, golden calf. They'd worshipped it. And God had said to Moses, Moses, I'm going to wipe them out and start again with you. Moses could have said yes, but he said, no, please, Lord, don't do that. Take my life instead of theirs. Wow, what a guy. God said, no, they will receive their punishment for their own sins. But he heard his prayer and he spared them. But the prayer I want to look at in this passage is, he said, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. We need the presence of God. And it's a wonderful thing to pray as we're praying for our Sunday morning meetings. Lord, would you fill these uh, these meetings, our humble offerings uh, to, to you, Father? Would you would you fill them with your presence, Lord? Would you fill me with your presence today? Would you fill my family with your presence? Lord, the Bible study, the prayer meeting, uh, when I'm at work, Father, could your presence go with me? That intangible presence of God. See, God had said, Moses, I'll, I'll, I'll let them go up to the promised land. I'll send my angel, I'll drive out their enemies, but I'm not coming. And Moses said, if you're not coming, I don't want to go. You see, he wanted the presence of God. In fact, the second prayer that he prays is this. He said, Lord, show me your ways that I may know you. These were spiritual prayers. Something happened to Moses when he was in the presence of God. The Bible says a light came upon his face. And in these days, we need to be changed by that presence. Moses wanted more uh, than his daily bread. He wanted more than protection. He wanted more than blessing. He wanted God himself. And as he was with God, something happened to even to his face, his face shone. And in these days of FaceTime and Zoom meetings, our colleagues, our friends, our people need 
Christians who had the glory of God, the presence of God upon them. So these are spiritual prayers. And this second prayer, Lord, show me your ways that I may know you. You know, we've all got funny ways. I'm sure my wife will tell you that I've got some very funny ways. And you kind of know me by those ways. We have a dog next door. And every night the owner lets the dog out at about 10 o'clock. And that dog, it's a massive, great kind of poodle thing. Um, and it just goes, woof, just one big bark, very loud. And that's it. Doesn't last, uh, doesn't uh, bark for a long time, just one bark. So we know it's Buddy. We know it's that big poodle looking dog. Moses said, I want to know you by your ways. We get to know God by his ways. And so Moses said, I want to know what makes you happy. I want to know what makes you sad. I want to know what makes you angry. God, I want to know you. And then the third thing that he prayed, and this is the uh, four word uh, prayer that I wanted to uh, go back to us talking about this morning. He said, show me your glory. Show me your glory. What, a, what an amazing prayer. You see, he wasn't content with God's presence going with them. He wasn't content with going no, knowing God's ways. He wanted to know God's glory. He wanted to know the greatest thing about God. He wanted to know what he was really like, the essence of his nature. God said to him, no, Moses. I can't do that for you because if you see my face, which is really what Moses was asking, you cannot live. You cannot live. But God said, well, what I'll do for you, Moses, is if you come up the mountain and you hide in that rock over that cleft in that rock, I'm going to put my hand over you. I'm going to pass by you and I'm going to let you see my back. But your face, you cannot, my face, you cannot see. And so that's what he did. But he said one other thing. He said, I'm going to proclaim my name to you. And after Moses had had that experience of seeing God's back, which no doubt was an extraordinary thing, he was left with something for the rest of his life. In fact, the words of this, um, this proclamation, are, it's probably the most quoted verses of the Bible within the Bible. Many of the great prayers, Hezekiah, Daniel, different people refer back to these words that God proclaimed to Moses. Let's have a look at this. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. This is Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Incredible words. God gave him his name and in that name was his nature. And there is a lifetime study in that prayer. So we're not going to make much of an attempt this morning. But I want to just bring out just some things in there that will help us in approaching God, that will give us faith to pray very quickly. First of all, it says merciful. There's an order in here. And the first thing that we meet, it's God's mercy. And that actual, the, the Hebrew word mercy or compassion is rachum. And it comes from the word that is used for the womb of a woman. And it's speaking about a deep feeling. Do you know God feels love for us when we approach him? Have you ever sensed his anger? I haven't. I always know he loves me. I don't know how, but by the spirit, I know that. And God wants us to know that he is a compassionate God. And this word rahum doesn't just mean feeling love. It means acting in love. And so the Bible says in John 3, 16, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that whoever put their trust in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
God loves us so much he put his very life upon the line there for us, suffering great pain uh, for us. And God loves us so much that he will act in answering our prayers. He is a compassionate and merciful God. And then the second word that is used there is gracious. God is a gracious God. And this the Hebrew word here is Hanan. And this word Hanan means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. It's someone bigger stooping down. And this speaks to us of God's grace. He does not answer our prayers because we are good. That's very important. He answers our prayers because he is good. And the next thing is steadfast love. He has steadfast love towards us. And this is one of the most wonderful words in the Bible that we don't have an equivalent in our language, has said. It's covenant love. It's love in a relationship. It's love that is born out of a commitment. It's good to remember when we pray that God, when we were born from above, when we were born of God, we were born into a covenant, reliable relationship with God that depends more upon him, entirely upon him, rather than upon us. And within that relationship, there are promises. And one of those promises is that God is faithful, which is the next word. He is the faithful God. The Bible says that when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So God is faithful to his word, faithful to his promises. It's in his nature. It's in his name. But we are faithless often, aren't we? The Bible says in James, we all stumble. That's all of us. That's me. That's you in many ways. So it's good to know that he is slow to anger. God's nature is not towards anger. There will be a day of wrath. There will be a day of judgment. But for us, the Bible says God is slow to anger and we need that. In fact, the Bible say, goes on to say here that he will forgive our iniquity, our sin and our transgression. How amazing that God will do that because we stumble often. And even today, if you are suffering from a guilty conscience, if you are, are, are feeling that God has given up on you and giving you hope today, he forgives our sins because the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for you. The Bible says if we confess our sin, that's prayer, to him, then he is faithful and he is just. You see, he's just. He doesn't just let sin go. Someone had to pay, but he paid himself with the blood of Jesus. So he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then finally, that awkward bit, when it says that the consequences of our sins will be upon our children, our children's children. That the things that we allow, the bad things in our lives have consequences, not only for us, but for others. And we have to realise that God is a holy and a just God. Our God is a consuming fire. And I want to just finish on this point, that we cannot manufacture God as uh, in the form that we would like him to be. He is who he, he is. But we must allow him to teach us about himself, to show us his glory through the Bible, through the Holy Spirit revealing his nature and his glory to us, through knowing his ways, through the circumstances of our lives. He is glorious. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a glorious God, a faithful God, a mighty God, a gracious God, a compassionate God. In this journey that we have begun in prayer, Lord, teach us to pray, not just how to pray, but to actually get down to it and pray. Father, today would you give us, as we listen, a spirit of prayer. Pour out upon us, as it says in Zechariah, a spirit of grace and supplication in Jesus' name. Lord, show us your glory. Amen.